So thank you, uh, Jim, and thanks to everyone for coming today. Um, hopefully we'll have uh, time for questions at, at the very end. So uh, these are my disclosures. If anyone is interested, I'm not going to be uh, discussing uh, approved therapies, but I will be talking about some of the clinical trials that we're doing, and I have uh, consulting relationships with several of those uh, companies. So um, uh, Bertrand Russell said a common thing, a common um, uh, thought that we've uh, heard in many different ways, but he says successors, in, in particularly in science, stand on the shoulders of their predecessors. So I thought I would begin this talk with uh, just a reminder of the history of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center at Washington University. Really, the uh, antecedents of the program began in the 1970s when a group of individuals uh, led by Leonard Berg began to have some weekly uh, brown bag discussions of uh, issues in dementia, which at, at this time, believe it or not, the, the uh, major interest was not in Alzheimer's disease. Matter of fact, that term was not well recognized, but it was in hydrocephalus. Because in the 1960s, a, a group, uh, Ray Adams and uh, uh, Argentinian neurosurgeon, uh, Hakim, reported that um, uh, a shunting uh, for hydrocephalus could restore uh, demented people back to normality. Uh, and this was very exciting because it was the first therapy for dementia, but as people started doing lots of shunts for presumed hydrocephalus, they found that people didn't get better. As a matter of fact, when they came to autopsy, they had Alzheimer's disease. So gradually the, uh, the issue uh, switched from hydrocephalus to what we now know as Alzheimer's. Leonard was joined by Dick Torak, uh, a neuropathologist in these uh, brown bag lunches and Charles Hughes, who was a neurologist, very interested in working with Leonard. And uh, eventually they developed um, a relationship with people on the Hilltop campus, now the Danforth campus, uh, Jack Botwinick and his uh, student, Martha Sturant. So these individuals, as I say, began the brown bag lunch series. They met, guess when? Tuesday afternoons at 12 noon. This is a continuation of that, of that series. Uh, they could not have succeeded in, in those early days without a lot of, hope, a lot of help uh, from then Department Chairman Bill Landau. And uh, Emily Labarge was the first uh, person uh, really uh, hired to administer the psychometric tests uh, that we uh, continue today. And I'll talk about uh, Zavin Kachaturian in just a moment. So this was the first grant that funded uh, dementia work at Washington University. Leonard was the principal investigator. It came from the National Institute of Mental Health. And it enrolled its first participant in August 1979. So you know what that means. This is the 30th anniversary of the uh, predecessor of the Alzheimer's Sem Center, the Memory and Aging Project. And Charles Hughes and Leonard and the team introduced uh, in this uh, initial project the clinical dementia rating. I say here that that, that grant, which was a three, three years of funding, uh, was succeeded by the program project, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia. That is true, but there was a hiatus of about a year and a half of funding because when they went back to the National Institute of Mental Health for a competing renewal, they were turned down. So they went without funding for a period of time. That's where Bill Lando, Emily, Emily Labarge really helped. And Zavin Kachaturian was new at the National Institute on Aging, and he heard about this longitudinal study of healthy aging and senile dementia, and he said, well, why don't you submit it to the National Institute of Aging? And that's when we began our program project. And then the following year, uh, the uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center was awarded. So these are... Uh, from those beginnings of that initial three-year grant, we now have, as uh, most everyone knows, four major grants uh, that are, uh, I, I hope, uh, very tightly uh, coordinated and integrated, and I'll tell you they're all going to be pursuing a uh, general research theme, and I'll discuss that in just a moment, but you see here the different uh, organizational plans, the cores in the center, 
uh, biostatistics, neuropathology, administration, and clinical serve all of these, uh, all of these grants. But uh, the grants, uh, even though they're complementary, have distinct uh, research projects. So one of the uh, characteristics, I think, of our Alzheimer's disease research has been uh, stable and cohesive uh, leadership. Uh, uh, sometimes we've been more cohesive than others, and other times we've been more stable. But uh, it, it, in general, uh, you can see that uh, Jean Johnson, Martha Durant, Jean Rubin, Betsy Grant, myself, have been with the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center from the very beginning. Now, you can say that this is cohesive and stable leadership, or you can say, gee, those guys are really old, but, but uh, nonetheless, I think that has given us uh, a, a, a really a, a fulcrum uh, a, about which we can uh, continually add and develop and grow other individuals. And uh, in that regard, if you look at the component leaders of the different uh, aspects of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center, Five years ago, when we last submitted our competing renewal application, you can see that uh, for all of the components, except the two that I'm leading, we've had a turnover of leadership. And you may not have um, appreciated this, and I, I think that's because the transitions were all very orderly and, uh, and uh, very successful. And uh, I think, again, that's an idea of where we can bring along of the next generation of leaders to take on increasing uh, leadership roles. And I, I think that's a, a real tribute to the Alzheimer's Disease Center uh, as a whole. We are multidisciplinary. We represent 14 uh, different departments throughout the entirety of Washington University. And we're interdisciplinary. That is, our questions, our research uh, activities cut across and integrate different disciplines. Uh, visitors to our Alzheimer's Center uh, remark upon uh, another aspect of what I think has been this uh, uh, residue of the leadership from the time Leonard uh, really began the program and has continued on, and that is we're very supportive of one another, very collegial, always happy, generally happy to help one another, and, uh, and we, we want to succeed. We want a can-do uh, atmosphere, and I, I, I think other centers do not have that type of cohesiveness and support. So I think that's really a, a, a very important characteristic of our center. So here, as I see it, are the, is the mission of the Alzheimer's Disease Center. We want to prevent Alzheimer's disease. Prevent Alzheimer's disease. And I'll, I'll come back and talk about that. We get at this by a variety of major themes. The first bullet point is something that really began in 1979. Characterize the clinical cognitive, behavioral, and biomedical correlates of Alzheimer's disease in comparison with non-demented aging. We're still doing that. But increasingly, we're looking at healthy older people, and we're asking, are the indicators that distinguish people with very early Alzheimer's disease from healthy aging, can some of those indicators actually be detected in healthy people and predict who is going to become demented, okay? So we're looking at preclinical, pre-symptomatic uh, Alzheimer's disease prior to the appearance of dementia. And we think we can do that. We think we can identify preclinical Alzheimer's disease. Now the next question is, when do those indicators begin? Is at age 75, age 70, 60, 50, 40? So we want to look at when during the lifespan those indicators begin, and which comes first, because the earliest changes we think likely are closest to the underlying mechanisms of Alzheimer's disease. So we want to understand the sequence of the changes that occur. Then finally, the ultimate goal is to translate what we learn about the chronology, the sequence, the different indicators, the proteins, uh, and develop and uh, test uh, therapies that truly will help individuals who have the illness and ultimately help the public. So just to indicate now, we've uh, come a long way since we began our first uh, study of a uh, drug in Alzheimer's disease called Tacrin. This was in the late 1980s, so over 20 years ago. And now we do very few, if any, drugs like Tacrin that are designed to improve symptoms of Alzheimer's, 
now the drugs and the agents that we're testing now are at least in, in principle developed to address one or more of the disease mechanisms that causes Alzheimer's disease. So these are the studies we're doing now. You see most of them have to do with uh, amyloid uh, beta, but we are uh, open to uh, any disease modifying uh, therapies. All right, so other strengths of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. I mentioned our, our four integrated grants, and I think that is a real a tribute to everyone uh, here. It's a luxury. I, I know of no other Alzheimer program that has even three major center-like grants. So we have four, and they're all uh, integrated around the research program, as I've just outlined, uh, healthy aging and senile dementia, looking for those indicators of Alzheimer's disease in a healthy older adult population, the adult children study, when during uh, the course of middle age, can we first detect those indicators, and now the dominantly inherited Alzheimer network to look at uh, individual indicators, their appearance and their timing of their appearance and their uh, sequence in individuals who carry a mutation that causes Alzheimer's disease. Throughout all of this has been the Memory and Aging Project, which remains uh, from 1979 on the clinical research office that provides the assessments, both clinical and cognitive, for all participants in a uni uniform manner. So I think this, this organizational pattern has, has served us uh, very well and allowed us to combine our resources very effectively. We have partners. And I think, uh, again, this is a, a, a real um, uh, element to the uh, success of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Uh, the St. Louis chapter of the Alzheimer's Association began in the early 1980s with uh, much support from then the Memory and Aging Project. The uh, uh, administrator of the Memory and Aging Project was a man named Warren Danziger and uh, helped co-found the, uh, the uh, St. Louis chapter. Many of the original uh, families uh, that uh, uh, formed the nucleus for the uh, St. Louis chapter uh, were le uh, families of Leonard's patients, and he was, of course, a major supporter of the St. Louis chapter. The African American Advisory Board, I'll talk more about this in, in just a few moments. That has been a, a, a real um, a positive uh, uh, component of what we are trying to do in our diversity ex uh, efforts. We have an internal ethics committee that provides very sage Council about very thorny uh, issues that we deal with in terms of confidentiality. I mentioned we're now with Diane, we're looking at people who carry a mutation that will cause Alzheimer's disease in those individuals. These are typically people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, uh, healthy, employed, uh, getting insurance, driving an automobile, raising families. What if it ever uh, became uh, known that they are going to develop Alzheimer's? How would that affect their insurability or their employment? Friedman Center for Aging, many of you know, is a, a parallel program that is university-wide uh, that uh, is uh, uh, focused on how we can improve a, a healthy uh, life for healthy older adults so they can remain productive and engaged. And then I think another uh, major piece of this is Washington University. I mentioned uh, 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 people remark when they come to visit us how, uh, how warm, how cordial, supportive, uh, collegial we are. I think that really is an is a ethos of Washington University, at least uh, as far as I've experienced in biomedical research. We do have tremendous uh, institutional support, including from the chancellor, the dean of the School of Medicine, and our department chair, uh, Dr. Holtzman. It, uh, if any of you are planning to begin an Alzheimer research program at, uh, anywhere, uh, I will tell you it is a good move to have your department chair as an associate director of your program. That's, that's very, very helpful. Alumni in development, uh, uh, we've uh, been uh, fortunate to work uh, closely with uh, key individuals, uh, David Blasingame and David Shear and then many uh, donors and friends of the Alzheimer's Center. Now, uh, 
so I mentioned I'll come back to the, uh, the African-American Advisory Board, and we have a tremendous board. We have a tremendous internal ethics committee and uh, all of our committees. But just to give you a, a sense of uh, how esteemed uh, different uh, individuals are uh, in, uh, from our African-American Advisory Board, you notice that next month there's going to be uh, 100 uh, of the most inspiring St. Louisans uh, recognized at the St. Louis uh, City uh, NAACP Centennial uh, and Annual Friedman, uh, Fun Freedom Fund Dinner. And uh, our uh, current chair, uh, Ida goodwin Wolfock, our past chair, immediate past chair, Bernice Thompson, and our founding chair, Norman Say, are all going to be uh, recognized. Matter of fact, one of the major awards that will be given out is named, at least in part, uh, for Norman. So this just gives a sense of, of their, um, uh, uh, their uh, leadership and their visibility in the, in the St. Louis committee, uh, in the St. Louis community. And we've had new members join the African American Advisory Board. Many of you know Brenda Battle, and she was named last year as one of the most influential minority uh, leaders uh, uh, by the St. Louis Business Journal. Uh, Joyce uh, Taylor uh, Haney from the Goldfarb uh, College of Nursing is a PhD candidate at UMSL, and Gwendolyn Deloche Packnett is chair of the 2010 Women of Achievement Lunch, and that's a very prestigious uh, post. Now, as I go through this, uh, I, I hope everyone recognizes that I, uh, I am remarkably uh, honored to be uh, the director of such a, a wonderful uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And each and every one of you contributes in a very important way. I cannot, in the time allotted, go through each and every one of you, uh, your contributions. So if for some reason I name the person seated to your right and I don't name you, uh, please don't be too terribly upset because everyone is valued. These are examples and I, I don't mean to uh, uh, ignore or uh, not honor everyone because I honor all of you. So uh, the people I'm, I'm, I'm choosing to, to report are, are uh, here for a reason, but it doesn't, uh, doesn't mean anything if you, you yourself are not reported. So uh, our, our organization, our partners, and we can never forget uh, as a, a key strength of our uh, Alzheimer's Center, our participants and their families. Uh, you see that they are remarkably dedicated, remarkably committed, we have uh, uh, worked very hard to retain individuals in the program. You, the strength of what we do is also embedded in our study design, which is longitudinal assessment change over time. So it's very important that we have our participants return, and 85% of them do. They contribute body fluids and imaging at a very high rate. And uh, with much work and uh, continued work, uh, we have a voluntary autopsy rate of 78%. So this gives you some, um, uh, uh, some information about uh, what a, uh, a really uh, remarkable group of participants uh, we have. And then another strength of the uh, ADRC is all of you. So this is, uh, I th when was this taken? Uh, last year at the state of the ADRC? Are we doing it again today? No. So we, we need to do this uh, annually because people do change, and this is the ADRC from a year ago, and uh, I, I, again, it, I, it, I'll just reiterate, it's a really uh, a privilege for me to be able to be involved in a leadership role with so many uh, highly talented and dedicated uh, individuals, and we have a remarkable group of, of investigators and staff. And all of this then pays off in productivity. So. Um, for those of you who are not uh, members of the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center or even the School of Medicine, uh, productivity, how well you are doing and achieving your research goals can be measured many ways, but two of the most common ways are how many peer-reviewed scientific articles are published and how many grants can you support or, or acquire for yourself. So five years ago, we had to list all of the ADRC's publications in the preceding five years, and we totaled up 213 peer-reviewed publications, and that was commented on in our review as being very, very good. 
But look now, 368 in the last five years. That's remarkable, so congratulations to all of you. We try to fund uh, new research, uh, particularly research proposed by junior investigators. And in the past uh, uh, five years, we've funded 18 pilot projects, typically of one year. And they already, in five years, have resulted in 20 peer-reviewed publications. And look at the remarkable success that our pilot grant awardees have had in generating their own grants, including 11 uh, R01s. That's, that's really remarkable. $18 million uh, have come from our investment in the pilot grant program. And the pilot grants are something like $35,000 for one year, and look how they, they pay off uh, down the road. And two of our uh, uh, pilot grant awardees are actually leading uh, scientific projects in uh, the competing renewal of our uh, Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Again, for those of you who are not uh, uh, always aware of this, the National Institute on Aging, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, funds all of four of our major grants. And each of those grants periodically, typically every five years, has to be completely rewritten, re-reviewed before we're extended for another five years. So I'm very proud to say that our original two grants, Healthy Aging and Senile Dementia, the program project started in 1984, and the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center started in 1985, have been continuously renewed every five years by the National Institute on Aging. That's remarkable. So now we're entering, for example, for healthy aging and senile dementia years 26 through 30 of research support. And we've just this month uh, put in our application for another five years of funding uh, for the Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. And, and if we are successful, and we will be, that will start next, uh, next May. Productivity continued. Uh, I'm not listing all the affiliated grants. There are many, but just to let you know that we support uh, over 200 uh, different uh, research studies by providing either data or tissue or participants in the neuropathology. So you can see over 200 grants are supported by the Alzheimer Center. And in addition to our research mission, which is developing the strategies that ultimately will help us prevent Alzheimer's disease, the other mission of the Alzheimer's Center is to encourage, foster, promote, stimulate Alzheimer's research at Washington University. We may not be doing it ourselves, but we're supporting these individuals, and we've been, uh, I think, remarkable in doing so. Neuropathology Corps has distributed tissue to 30 faculty, both within and without Washington University, and the Genetics Corps distributed DNA and other uh, data to 80 investigators. Uh, uh, Randy Buckner, when he was here, along with Dan Marcus, developed the open access series of imaging studies. These are uh, uh, MRI uh, uh, scans uh, 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 protected against uh, any uh, clinical information to prevent identification of the participants that uh, uh, really run the uh, age spectrum, but many of them are of uh, ADRC participants. And uh, uh, after Randy left, Dan has been uh, 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 leading this, and this is available to anybody. So anybody can get data from uh, scans throughout the life span, span, and now we're getting longitudinal scans, so people can look at whether there's change over time in an 85-year-old and then scanned again at 87. Is there change over time in any brain region free of charge? Don't, don't even have to get uh, permission to do so. So this is remarkable data sharing. And then our education core is uh, also remarkable. You can see that in the past five years, they've been training over, uh, providing educational forums and training over 19,000 individuals, both uh, the public as well as professionals. And we're very proud of training. I indicated, but let me uh, re-indicate that uh, one of our missions is to bring along the next generation or generations of individuals. Part of that is our uh, fellowship training program. We've been remarkably successful. Uh, Jeff Burns, uh, many of you remember, has already been, uh, he was uh, left here uh, about five years ago, was appointed as assistant professor of neurology and now is associate, promoted to associate professor. Randy Bateman uh, just finished his fellowship two years ago, already as assistant professor. Nupur Goshal is our current postdoctoral fellow, and she will get a faculty appointment uh, in July. 
and Moran Tarana begins in July uh, to replace uh, Nuper. So we're very fortunate in the quality of our, um, our trainees. By the way, the, uh, uh, how many of you have heard the, the old adage, um, if you wish to live long, choose your parents well? Have you heard that? So I would say with our trainees, if you want to be an excellent mentor, choose your trainees well. And we've been very successful in doing that, fortunate, I would say, in doing that. Lots of people come here from uh, around the country and, and throughout the world. And I uh, point out that in the past uh, four years, we've had eight visitors, uh, uh, scholars, come uh, to uh, further their training with us. We uh, continually have uh, students uh, come from different disciplines, and, and again, international-based. Uh, and we have, uh, we're often the um, sort of gold standard Alzheimer Center, if you will, for uh, centers that are in trouble and want to see how a successful center runs or a brand new center. And next month, we're going to be hosting a brand new center at University of Wisconsin in Madison, we're going to come and do a site visit, spend a, a, a day and a half with us to learn our operation. And then I think the Leonard Berg Symposium now is on the uh, calendar, uh, on the schedule of, uh, of uh, very highly regarded uh, uh, symposia uh, nationally and internationally, and uh, beginning in October, uh, we're going to uh, have the seventh Berg Symposium, happens every two years, on pre-symptomatic detection of dominantly inherited Alzheimer's disease. World leaders, uh, you know, I, I, I think we all feel pride in our center. Uh, we also, we're from the Midwest. We tend to be modest. We, we struggle to say these things, but I think we are world leaders. And uh, there, I said it. I got it off my chest. Uh, uh, so sometimes I think we're, we, um, we don't, um, uh, let's see how to say this. We could be more um, aggressive, perhaps, in uh, uh, promoting what it is we do and how we do it. Uh, sometimes I think we're content to do very good work, write very good manuscripts, publish in very good journals, and let that do the trick. But I, I think, uh, think, unfortunately, it takes more than that. You have to uh, present at different uh, meetings and continually uh, present to get your point across. Otherwise, um, uh, we're, we're sometimes uh, not... Uh, not always taken as, uh, as in the light that we should be. But we are world leaders in characterizing the early symptomatic stages of Alzheimer's. Uh, I just uh, mentioned two uh, manuscripts that I think have been very influential in that regard in the past several years. We're also the world leaders in identifying preclinical Alzheimer's disease. So this is Alzheimer's disease beginning in the brain in healthy people. They have no symptoms of memory loss, no dementia, no problems. But the idea is, if they continue to live and those Alzheimer lesions continue to develop, that they will develop Alzheimer's. So this is a way that we think we can begin to predict individuals who are in good health but are destined to get Alzheimer's disease. And ultimately, of course, we want to identify these people with high reliability and accuracy to ultimately provide them with therapies that might prevent Alzheimer's. So we are, again, I think, my opinion, the world leader in preclinical Alzheimer's. Uh, Joel Price and I uh, had, had a very productive uh, collaboration for almost 20 years, and a uh, new uh, ma ma paper from Joel and a group of us uh, uh, just came out uh, just a month or so ago, the neuropathology of non-demented aging really replicates work that uh, Joel and I have been doing for, for many years. Biomarkers, and antecedent biomarkers means a biomarker is a test for Alzheimer's disease, and antecedent means before dementia. So again, this gets right at the heart of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. People who have Alzheimer pathology, what test can we use to detect it before symptoms? Because now we have to wait to diagnose Alzheimer's disease when people are demented. We think that's too late for truly effective therapies. Amyloid imaging, Mark Minton, the imaging group, uh, had a very influential paper in neurology, it's uh, 2006, not 2009, about uh, PIB imaging, amyloid imaging, plaque imaging in people who are healthy. Uh, Allison Goat in the genetics core are looking at 
cerebral spinal fluid uh, fa uh, factors, uh, markers of Alzheimer's disease, in this case a, a level of a protein tau, to help identify otherwise uh, undisclosed genetic factors that can lead to uh, Alzheimer's disease. Ann Fagan, Dave Holtzman, uh, the very uh, much world leaders in uh, looking at spinal fluid markers of Alzheimer's disease and recently uh, published a paper that uh, shows in healthy people who have amyloid in the brain, uh, we think that this is not a good thing to have amyloid in the brain, even though the, the brain may be, uh, the mind may otherwise be healthy. And what they found was a very important uh, finding that the, the more amyloid you have, the smaller your brain is. Your brain shrinks if you have amyloid in the brain. So this is an indication that preclinical Alzheimer's disease is not benign. And Randy Bateman, along with Dave Holtzman, uh, uh, Randy has been leading uh, uh, the only, only uh, method in the world is right here at Washington University to allow uh, evaluation of drugs that are supposed to affect whether amyloid, this protein we think is at the heart of causing Alzheimer's disease, can be affected in terms of how much is produced or how fast it's cleared away from the brain in living people. And uh, Randy just has a, a paper that looks at a drug, a gamma secretase inhibitor, uh, does it actually have the intended effect on amyloid production? A very important uh, 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 study and very important method. And then preclinical Alzheimer's disease, once again, how is it that people can tolerate all that amyloid pathology in the brain without having symptoms, at least for some period of time? And Kathy Rowe has been interested in this idea of reserve, people who have uh, brains that work really well or really big brains may be able to tolerate that pathology longer before they ulti ultimately demand. So she's been looking at uh, issues related to cognitive reserve. Honors, well, so tremendous organization, tremendous participants, tremendous partners, tremendous faculty and staff, all of this uh, leads to productivity and to recognition. Our clinical uh, faculty practice, the Memory Diagnostic Center, uh, consistently rates in the highest echelon at Washington University Medical Center in terms of patient satisfaction. It, it is a really uh, uh, remarkable how many of our uh, memory, di not memory Diagnostic Center f uh, uh, physicians are rated very highly. But of those of you physicians who are here and are rated very highly, we all know that, that none of that would really come to pass without our Memory Diagnostic Center nursing staff and support staff because it's those individuals, you know, the initial phone call, the initial intake and so forth that really lay the, uh, the groundwork for our positive experience by our patients. Uh, Gene Rubin, who's been with the uh, ADRC since 1985, last year was honored by Washington University uh, School of Medicine with an Alumni Faculty Award. Judy Leipoltz, who I have to say is sort of uh, a camera hog. She always is trying to get uh, in the limelight. And she was named as a star performer in the Department of Neurology, uh, and uh, very deservedly so, because she has been a real uh, tr um, tremendous behind the scenes person to make everything work. And then Virginia Buckles uh, has uh, recently been profiled in uh, the Washington University record for the excellent work uh, that she does. Uh, Dave Holtzman has uh, just been elected to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. This is very prestigious. I think it uh, would be very difficult for an MD uh, to have a higher honor unless it were a Nobel Prize. This is really remarkable. So uh, he is now at the IOM. And uh, you probably know that the U.S. News and World Report comes out every year and lists best hospitals. Uh, and the hospitals that don't make the top 10 always say, and, and correctly, that this is really a popularity contest, doesn't really measure the quality of the hospital. And of course, the hospitals in the top 10 say this is a really great thing, we're the best. Um, but Dave, I think, is going to have a feature in that, on, on, by himself, uh, about himself, in that uh, best hospital. So we really do want to get that issue, a uh, July issue of 2009. Consuelo Wilkins uh, from, uh, uh, was recently inducted at Howard uh, university where she went to medical school in the uh, most prestigious uh, medical honor society, Alpha Omega Alpha. 
Uh, I've been tapped to give a named a lecture at the American Neurologic Association this October. Uh, Rawan, who I mentioned is coming on as fellow in, um, in uh, July, is just finishing up her neurology residency here at, at, uh, uh, at uh, Washington University in Department of Neurology. And each year, all the neurology residents across the nation take an examination to make certain that they are uh, accumulating, assimilating all the knowledge that they've learned during their training. And for two years in a row, she has scored 100%, the highest score possible. No one else has gotten 100%, so she's at the top every year. And then, of course, our ADRC uh, has been uh, uh, featured on uh, uh, TV programs, including uh, the past couple months, uh, our local P uh, PBS program and then the HBO series. Uh, Nigel Cairns uh, was elected fellow of the Royal College of Neuropathologists in the United Kingdom. Uh, I was honored in February to go to India and in Chennai, the former uh, Madras, to give the 29th uh, T.S. Uh, Srinivasan oration. It was a very illuminating experience for me. Influence. We have a remarkable influence, even though we're quiet, modest uh, Midwesterners. We have a remarkable influence. We do a lot of things. So uh, the Alzheimer's disease centers, are 29, funded by the National Institute on Aging, uh, have a number of important missions to do in aggregate. One of them is to identify and develop and implement an assessment for all individuals who come to all the 29 centers for their evaluation to develop a standard database that everyone can use. So everyone is using a uniform data set. It was developed by a clinical task force that I chair uh, uh, from all the Alzheimer's disease centers. Uh, this uniform data set's been, uh, of course, in, in place since 2005 and is becoming a very important uh, uh, product of our, um, of our uh, work. Uh, it's also very important that I was the chair because uh, if I had not, we would be doing our clinical assessments in a very different way. Because uh, I think I mentioned last time, most centers do not routinely in evaluate informants. Uh, for healthy people, they uh, don't have informants. And the neurologist or geriatrician or psychiatrist has very little involvement other than doing the uh, physical neurologic examination. Most of it is done by nurses, assistants, and neuropsychologists. So we would, uh, if we weren't uh, leading it, uh, it would be very different. Now, uh, don't you think all these other 28 centers are so grateful that they get to do it uh, our way? <laughs> uh, Jim Galvin, uh, in, uh, since uh, last September, has been elected the chair of the Education Corps Steering Committee. Uh, for some reason, I'm on 10 external advisory committees out of these uh, 29. Uh, centers, and uh, for some reason I chair each of them, so we again have a lot of influence for all of those uh, centers. Uh, Allison also serves on a couple of uh, external advisory committees. I'm just finishing up my uh, fourth year in the National Advisory Council of Aging. This advises the NIA, National Institute on Aging, and uh, I have a number of roles there, including chairing the, the program, what goes on at our three council meetings a year, and reviewing their intramural program as well as the Division of Neuroscience program. The Division of Neuroscience is what funds, funds us. Allison and I are on the Medical and Scientific Advisory Council for the Alzheimer's Association, and uh, I'm uh, unfortunately playing an increasing role in the American Academy of Neurology. Well, this is a snapshot of our participants. So we have 450 people, 60 and over. We have two additional samples the adult children study, younger, middle-aged, healthy people, and just beginning to enroll our Diane individuals, uh, even younger yet. But this is our core, core group that we see annually, 450 individuals. You see, on average, they're in their uh, mid to late 70s, generally well-educated, uh, more uh, women overall than men. Uh, African-American uh, uh, representation is increasing, uh, still below the 18% of uh, the greater metropolitan St. Louis area, and uh, many of these uh, people are really performing very well from a, a mental standpoint, cognitive standpoint. These are the diagnoses. You can just look at the total. The important thing is 
uh, consonant with our research uh, goals to look at indicators for Alzheimer's disease in people without dementia, we now have uh, gradually over these last five years uh, progressed so we see many more non-demented people than we see demented people. So that's the bulk of what we see now are healthy older individuals and we focus on Alzheimer's disease so we have few uh, individuals who have non-Alzheimer dementias. Uh, African Americans, uh, I, I've told this story, I, I won't uh, reiterate it, but uh, until we really uh, did establish the African American Advisory Board and uh, led originally by uh, Norman Say and then subsequently by uh, Bernice and, uh, and uh, now Ida, um, our, uh, we had no policy for in trying to improve the diversity of our uh, participants. Uh, but we've made a great deal of effort. We've been led by many dedicated people at the uh, center, Tom Muser, uh, Jim Galvin now, uh, Barbie, uh, Murda Spencer, and uh, Monique and Consuelo played tremendous roles. I, I don't know that Monique has a personal life. She's always giving a talk somewhere on Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and it's, it's paid off. You see that uh, for a two-year period, from 2006 to 2008, we enrolled a total of 144 participants into our overall registry of which 25% were African American. Now we started low, so the total registry is still only 12%, but we're moving up thanks to the dedication of all these individuals. Very important that we learn about Alzheimer's disease in people of all backgrounds. If we only learn about uh, Alzheimer's from a segment of the population, we won't know how well it uh, translates to other segments of the population. So all of the studies we do, ultimately we want to uh, have inclusiveness by all of our participants. We're making grounds with lumbar puncture. That's the toughest. Uh, African Americans are, have always been, in, with, uh, with justification, concerned about uh, being uh, manipulated or uh, used and uh, invasive procedures such as lumbar puncture has, has been a real, uh, real barrier. Uh, but we're making some progress there. You see in 2005 to 2006, we had 86 whites had LP, which is only six African Americans. In the last two years, we've doubled the number of African Americans who have had LP. We're also the same way uh, uh, have a barrier uh, in, in uh, overcoming and building trust among African Americans about autopsy. Again, are we going to uh, use the uh, tissue appropriately or are we just experimenting on individuals? And our autopsy rate among African Americans has always been around 25 percent and just in the past year we were uh, pleased to see it's up to 45 percent but again we have a long way to go to match our uh, our uh, autopsy rate in whites. And again, very important, if we only study brains of white people, we're only going to learn about the pathology of Alzheimer's disease, the lesions in that group of people. So we have to do a better job in uh, improving our diversity. Okay, so those are, the, those are the good points. Challenges. We're big, four big center grants. Huge. That brings a lot of burden. I think everyone should uh, turn to Linda Amos and, Vir and Virginia Buckles and say, don't ever go anywhere, stay right where you are. They, they do the, you know, any one of those grants would take that team. They're doing it four, four times now. So we, tremendous burden, we need more individuals and we're beginning to uh, develop uh, some positions to help uh, Linda and particularly Virginia. We ask a lot of our participants. I said they're dedicated. Of course they're dedicated because they come back and do everything we ask and we ask a lot of them. This is a tremendous burden on them and stress for the staff and clinicians. It's difficult to get everything done. We all have other responsibilities and we're constantly trying to make sure we uh, c conserve enough time to do our ADRC mission, evaluate individuals in a longitudinal fashion. We only have a small group of individuals who really are eligible, interested, and willing to participate in our clinical trials. And our trials are becoming enormously uh, difficult to do. Lots, not just one lumbar puncture, but three, and lots of scans, and lots of visits. Tremendous, uh, overwhelming burden for our nurse coordinators. We need space. As we get bigger, we not only need more personnel, we need more space already. Uh, we've had little satellites. The Education Corps is two buildings away. The Psychometrics Group is on another floor. 
and we, now we have another clinical assessment site out at Barnes Jewish Hospital, uh, West County. I want to bring all of us uh, together again under one roof. So one thing that we always have to uh, uh, guard against is that uh, each uh, group, uh, genetics, imaging, uh, uh, biomarkers, uh, whatever, uh, looks at their own uh, data that they acquire in their component, and they're very familiar with that, and they keep their own data set and uh, write uh, papers, develop grants from that. We're, our strength is integrating across the entire Alzheimer's Center, so we always have to do this. We're working on it, including our uh, uh, keep Betsy in the loop, and that's what's regularly submit data to data management and statistics core, and informatics. And we're working on that. Uh, notice that informatics is near operational on uh, three cores, neuropathology, genetics, and biomarkers, and electronic data collection for the clinical core is coming up. Now, the bets are already being placed as to whether electronic data collection will kill me or I will kill uh, it, but we, we'll see if uh, we can actually accomplish this. And remember in your manuscripts always to cite the relevant grant numbers or foundation support or whatever. This is the way people tally uh, how well their investment is working. Funding, always an issue. It's improved. I'm going to mention this in just a moment. But even though it's improved, every time we get one of these competing renewals, continuously renewed, that sounds great, now they're coming, we're lopped off the budget request that we have automatically, 18%. It's a real problem. This economic downturn, many of us, I've encouraged many of you to apply to the Alzheimer's Association for funding for grants. And this year, they're not going to be able to fund nearly as many, maybe only half of what they normally do. We need to improve some clinical research areas, and, and I, I won't belabor this DSM-5, but we need more strength, I think, more people in neuropsychology, and particularly in structural uh, imaging. We need uh, to ensure diversity. I mentioned our uh, African-American participants. Of course, that's only part of it. We need to be diverse in our faculty and our staff. As I've mentioned, we have tremendous help uh, from uh, a number of our partners and uh, components of the Alzheimer's Center, uh, and we uh, always need to remain uh, aware of cultural competency. And uh, for visibility, I think the Norman uh, RSA lecture has been a, a major uh, factor, and we're looking forward to it again uh, this year in November. So let me talk about new developments in the NIH. And some of you know about this, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, or ARRA, or ERA, is going to provide billions of dollars to the NIH. Some of it is earmarked for repair improvements and construction of research facilities, others for equipment, yet again, comparative effectiveness research, what are the best ways to do things, but about seven and a half million up to maybe 8.2 billion, uh, billion, I'm sorry, up to maybe 8.2 billion is going to be given for increased extramural funding. That means to us, to investigators outside of the NIH. Of that, across all NIH, 273 million is going to go to NIA. There's a catch. All of it has to be spent this year and next. Short term. This is a recovery act. Matter of fact, part of the uh, part of the uh, obligation of the, of the grant applicant is to show how it's going to increase jobs. But also it will help for, uh, fund some grants that are peer-reviewed, well peer-reviewed, but just miss the paid, uh, pay cut, uh, not quite at the, uh, at the uh, percentile where they will be paid. Well, now they might be paid if they can adapt and do their five-year project in two years. They have to modify it for two years of funding. There are the opportunities for administrative supplements. I've asked Linda and, and Virginia to look into this about whether we can use some of these supplements in, in the next two years to, to fund perhaps new positions. The, these do not go out for peer review, so that means NIA staff has to look at them, and with all their other activities, they're not encouraging this because they're uh, only one of few because otherwise they'll be inundated. And then there's an opportunity for what we used to call competitive supplements, now called competitive revisions. So this is President Obama signing this 
uh, American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act into law. And now the NIH always shows this slide, how grateful they are for the NIH to help play its part in improving the health and economy. There also are new programs uh, funded by ERA, the challenge grants. The deadline for this was in April. Two-year grants again, jumpstart research, up to $500,000 a year for two years. So you had to be ready to go. Remember, this was signed into law in mid-February, and the grant deadline was, I think, end of April. They plan to fund 200-some grants. They don't have an absolute number. Already, I was in council last week, they already have 21,000. So that means less than 1% funding success rate. We submitted five as an ADRC. Those are the individuals listed in their grant uh, themes. They're all going to be paid by the end of September because if they wait longer, they only have one year to do everything. So they have to pay everything by end of September. So hopefully we'll have all five successful. There also are grand opportunity grants, go grants. Deadline is this week. Unlimited budget, unlimited. Have to be over 500,000 a year, but no, no ceiling. And uh, ADNI is going, going in with a 24 million grant at the end of this week, 24 million for two years. All right, so I said I hope everyone who applied from the ADRC gets a challenge grant. There will be some accountability, quarterly budget reporting. You know how everyone groans here when we ask you for your annual budget report? This is quarterly reporting. And you have to indicate in, in detail all the projects and activities uh, that you have been supported by your challenge grant and the number of jobs created. I see a problem down the road. This is not for the NIH in particular, but the same information. 2009 is this infusion of stimulus grants, shown in yellow. So, you know, we know this, right? Research is a long-term investment. So we're going to put these funds in, grow jobs. What happens 2011 when there's no more ERA grant fund? We tell all these people, well, we got you recovered, now go somewhere else. I mean, it, it very hard, very hard to do this, and, and people have not really worked uh, out how this is going to happen. So that was February, the American uh, Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Congress funded the NIH in March with an Omnibus Appropriations Act that gave us a one, gave NIH a $1 billion increase, representing 3.2% of the total budget. Uh, in 2009 compared to 2008. This meant a little bit less for NIA, 2.7 percent, but it was enough to raise the pay line from 10.5 percent to 11.6 percent. Again, for those of you who are unaware, this means of all the grants that are submitted for uh, uh, being funded by the NIA, you have to be in the top 10 or 11 percent to get funded. So about 90 percent of people who apply do not get funded. An interesting aspect of this grant, uh, President Obama, when he was in the campaign, made a pledge to uh, double the amount of funding for cancer research. This is the first time that cancer, that any disease has been specified. Six billion dollars this year of this Omnibus Appropriation Act is going to go to cancer research only. Now this is across NIH, so if somebody were studying, for example, the inverse relationship between cancer and Alzheimer's disease, they would be eligible, but this is the first time this has happened. So now this means all the advocacy groups are going to say, well, gee, if you can, you can earmark cancer, you can earmark Alzheimer's or autism or AIDS. Give us six billion dollars. So this is really going to uh, open Pandora's box. Look at next year. We better get funded this year because <laughs> the increase to next year is going to be much less. For all of NIH this year, it's 3.2% increase. Next year, his budget already submitted is 1.4%. Why? Because he's just put in all that ERA funding. He says you won't need an another increase next year. So get funded this year. Finally, just as a note, all manuscripts resulting from NI any NIH funding must be submitted to PubMed Central. Must be. 
What this means is, uh, well, I don't know what it means, but, but, <laughs> but it, it's a problem. And it's a problem because uh, if you don't comply, there's some number now, right? There's some number that comes out or something like that? No? So I really don't know what this is. But, but you have to comply. And just because I don't know doesn't mean you shouldn't do what I say. So, uh, Because technically, you could have your grant suspended. But more importantly, if you don't do whatever we're supposed to do, I get notices from the NIA to John Morris, your recent progress report submission identified papers that have resulted from your NIH award. These citations listed below did not include evidence of submission to PubMed Central. Thus, it's not possible to determine if they're in compliance. So I'm tired of getting these notices. Okay. So, so do whatever we're supposed to do. All right. So. Um, you know, early symptomatic Alzheimer's disease versus MCI, that debate continues. There's going to be an advisory workshop this June, uh, co-sponsored by the National Alzheimer's Association, uh, about 20 people, I'll be one of them, to determine whether the time is right to revise diagnostic criteria. So hopefully we can uh, make an impact. Research, our research is shifting to early, even pre-symptomatic detection. Rather than focus only on treatment of dementia, that's when the symptoms of Alzheimer's are established, we want to promote and develop strategies to intervene before symptoms appear. That is, we want to transport therapeutic approach from simply looking at cures of people with the dementia to trying to prevent the dementia. And these are areas, this MCI debate and research on preclinical Alzheimer's. I say we're world leaders. In some ways, we're pioneers. But also, we haven't really yet. I think Gene Rubin keeps informing me that the world is, is beginning to come our way and believe in what we're doing. And I think he's probably right. But I'm also, I want to close with this quote from Bertrand Russell again. Do not fear to be eccentric in opinion, for every opinion now accepted once was eccentric. So hopefully everyone will come to realize that MCI is early stage Alzheimer's. Thanks very much. <laughs>